Then I'm gonna take this rusty cab corner and replace it with this slightly less rusty cab corner. Now it looks like it's just rusted on the bottom. But uh, you can bet your biscuits that uh, we're gonna end up probably having to come up to here almost by the time we're done. Cab corners and most body panels rust from the inside out. So what you see on the outside is actually only gonna be part of the problem. So before we get too carried away, the first thing I usually like to do is I like to strip off all the uh, paint or surface rust or whatever about two to three inches away from where the actual rust perforation is. And we wanna pay special attention to anywhere where it's bubbling up. Sometimes this can just be surface, but uh, if there's rust down here, then we know that this could very well be uh, a hole that's about to poke through. So we wanna just clear away all of this and uh, see what we actually have left to work with. Well, uh, we stripped off the paint, and like I said, remember how there was all those little bubbles? Well, now we have these little dark areas of rust, and you could just say that's surface rust, but as soon as I take my screwdriver, I can just poke a hole right through everywhere that... So... That's not really uh, a surprise, but you can see the importance of doing this before, well, before you start cutting up this, obviously, and before you start trying to cut and weld anything in lower down, the rust is always gonna be higher than what you see on the outside. This is probably one of the problems I think people have with welding sheet metal is they, uh, well, maybe they do strip it down, but there's still these these dark spots here where the rust has already come through, and then they come down here, try and put it in a nice little patch there. If I could, I would very much like to put in a nice little patch at the bottom instead of going all the way up here. People try to do that, and then they don't cut all the rust out, and then they try welding, and they come up to these little spots like this, and then you just blow a hole as soon as you try to weld it. As you saw, I cut off the uh, old cab corner. And what I do, whenever I cut off something, is I take a look on the inside to see if I've gone high enough. And what I'm looking for is anything like this. Well, this is all still solid metal. There's no chunks missing or anything. But I come into here, and this is all very eaten up here. So, like I said, there's already pinholes there. And if we go up to here, this is almost the hole. And it's all pretty chewed up along this edge. Same thing goes through here. It's all very eaten up. So when I see stuff like this, well, I know I'm going to have to uh, go up a little bit higher because I want to try and get away from that. Is it still, there's still quite a bit of metal eaten away there. So that ain't gonna weld too good. So on this, in this case, I can see the back side of the panel. So I already know that I have to go higher. I'm gonna go about another inch up or so. But if, if you can't see the back side of the panel, then I just do exploratory cuts like this. And if I saw this, then I know I'd probably have to go up another inch or so. So I take off another inch, have a look at the back side. 
see what it looks like and uh, eventually hopefully get to solid metal now just because it's pitted doesn't necessarily mean it's bad but you have to kind of use your common sense here I know that's hard sometimes but like if you're doing a Model A or something that's been laying on the ocean floor for 2,000 years probably the entire thing is going to be pitted metal so again you got to kind of do uh, forensic analysis there I mean if if over 50% of the metal is eaten away from pitting then I mean you're probably going to want to go higher and uh, not try and weld into that that's one thing I like about TIG welding is if I'm doing like a model A or something where the the metal the whole thing is just pitted metal that's been sitting outside with no paint on it forever and like it's still solid but there is pitting well then I the TIG welder you have full control as you're welding so if you come to a thin spot you just change your pedal the amount of amps you're putting in and you can just keep going and you don't burn any holes whereas with a MIG welder you set it once and then you just start welding and all you're doing is pulling the trigger there's there's no control at all so on something like this where if I go I know from looking at the inside already that if I go up another inch I'm gonna be into nice solid metal like this so there's no point in trying to weld to thin metal if, if I don't have to. Anyways, this is just uh, another one of those things where you know I can't be there to see everybody's individual situation but I guarantee you if it looks like this on the back side you're just gonna blow holes and make a big mess and you know even if I was to try and weld that I haven't welded in a long time and I would just make a mess of that all I do is just keep blowing holes and and uh, then you get all that those bits of wire sticking out the back the little porcupine technique there and that stuff is just a big rust magnet you get a bunch of that sticking out the back and and rust is just drawn to that like instantly and and then you got to get out the fiberglass and go over that and go over all your panels and everything and you know you end up with a big sculpture and and uh you get frustrated and that's uh that's no good it's supposed to uh, be fun apparently so i uh cut the cab corner down a little bit i left myself an extra inch to inch and a half on here so i got some material to play with because the other thing I see fairly often is people get panels like this and they think you have to use the, the entire panel. And what I try to do is I try to splice things in where there's going to be more strength. By that I mean, I'm sure you can tell here that this has a, a lot of curve in it. Whereas the higher we go up here, this gets very flat and a lot of the curve goes away. So all this extra curve, this is giving it extra strength. And the more strength it has, the easier it is to weld in without it doing crazy things, warping and making a big mess. So the other thing that gives a panel strength is, is body lines and things like that. So I try to always put in panels like these, these cab corners and stuff where in an area where it has the most strength and again that's not always possible you know if it's rusted up to here then you you don't really have much choice but if it's not then only use what you need off the patch panel and try to put it in a strategic location if if I have a body line say I had a body line through here I would section in the panel either an inch below or an inch above that body line and that body line again will act as an area of strength and it'll help prevent any uh, extra you know warping and stuff so if I tried to weld the cab corner up through here you can see the back of this cab is very flat and so I try sectioning it in here what's going to happen is, is as I'm welding the heat's going to rise as it does and it's going to want to buckle in a large area on the back of this cab and you're going to end up with a big swale on it and then you got to go back and you know body work the whole thing and and uh that's just not really uh not really ideal uh the other thing 
and this is just something I picked up from doing collision and stuff, is you want to always leave something for the next guy. So, I mean, if you're doing collision and you're sectioning in a quarter panel or something, well, it's not uncommon for a late model vehicle to get in multiple collisions, especially because people can't drive anymore. So you section in your full quarter panel and you use the whole panel, and then the next guy comes along and it needs a quarter panel again. Well, now where's he gonna section in the quarter panel? Somebody's already used the whole panel. And so I try to, you know, if it's good practice to kind of leave something for the next guy, same with rust repair on late models. Yeah, a vehicle is driven every day in the salt and snow and rain and whatever. It might need, you know, two or three different rust repairs in its lifetime. So you go and section on your cab corner or whatever on your your new truck and you use the whole panel and then uh well let's say five years down the road it's rusted out again and you bring it back to the body shop well now what are they going to do you use the whole panel and you didn't need to and now it's rusted out along the weld seam and it, the whole thing's rusted out and well i don't know now you got to try and go to a junkyard and find a, a good panel and cut that out and weld it on or, or what do you do now in theory, uh, this thing's probably only going to be getting one cab corner in its lifetime, but you never know, in another 70 years somebody might want to tart this thing up again for resale. Uh, so you want to kind of leave the next guy in the future a little extra material to work with. Bad news, I'm going to talk some more. I promise we'll eventually get to the uh, sparks and, and welding and stuff like that that people actually watch. But I know if I don't explain stuff, then uh, people get mad. Anyways, now that I'm a huge YouTube sensation, I'm not supposed to be uh, negative anymore. We're supposed to be all positive and smiles and coddle everybody and hold their hands. And, you know, this is 2022, so we're all very accepting. And Anyways, uh, we got sidetracked again. Uh, I think this channel is just going to shift gears and it's just going to turn into cats and Kyle ranting about stuff. This is applicable to these 1947-54 to 54 Chevy truck cab corners, although the same can be said for just about uh, probably any patch panel. But this is just what I have found from doing these, is the door edge that comes on the panel, the replacement panel, is completely out to lunch. So if it's at all possible on these, and usually it is if, if the truck's not a rusted pile of absolute garbage like this one is, is I save this edge. I don't, I just leave it on and I leave myself about three quarters of an inch if it's still solid on here. So I leave all of this up to about here. And then I cut this off right along this edge and then I'll lay the cab corner on and then it just fits so much better when you do that. And not just this edge, but just the way it fits around the back and everything. It Unfortunately, on this truck, this truck is a rusted pile of garbage. This edge was right on the verge of total failure. And the other issue is that if you've been watching my videos, you saw that the door was in fact rubbing on the cab corner. So no matter what, uh, the factory one didn't fit very well. And so, uh, and it was compromised by rust. So I don't have much choice but to use this. So uh, we'll be showing you how to change the full panel here and how to work around it. Again, very much preferred to section it in because not only does this edge fit better usually, but like the whole, just the way it fits, the shape is uh, so much better if you don't have to leave this in place. But like I said, when you do cut this off the aftermarket panel, cut it right, right along this edge and then leave yourself about three quarters of an inch on here. You'll find when you lay it on in, in its most relaxed position, you'll end up probably sectioning it back here. And if you try and cut it, cutting this, back to three quarters of an inch, you're not gonna have enough material on there just because of the way this is stamped. I set the cab corner on and I try to find, you know, where it's 
most relaxed position is. Unfortunately, if I if I put this where in theory it should line up, which is like down here somewhere, it's like completely out to lunch. So I have to actually kind of roll it up like this. And on these trucks, this edge at the bottom here, you can't go off of that. At least not when you're leaving this edge on. Because if you go off of that, there's not enough material on here on the bottom of these patches compared to what the factory had. So don't go off of that, go off the overall shape and how it's going to fit the door the best. Did I mention you have to have the door on? Extremely important to have your door fit while you're doing cab corners on anything. If you don't have the door fit and you weld your cab corners on, you're going to be very disappointed in the results. My main concern is going to be this, how it fits the door. Everything else we can work with but if it doesn't fit the door, then it's, uh, well, it's garbage. So I have this laid on where I think it's going to fit the door. Now the problem is, is I'm overlapping right now. And so that overlap is affecting how the entire rest of the panel fits as well as how it fits here. So the only way to overcome that is... This is where you have to take a leap of faith because you can test fit it on here like this when it's overlapping and you can spend a month of Sundays on that, get it as good as you think it's going to be. And then as soon as you go and cut this to butt weld it in or it's overlapped, it's going to completely change on you. So what I do is I have it laid on here where I think it's supposed to be. And I'm just going to scribe. Don't use a marker. You have to scribe it. Markers aren't accurate enough. And I scribed this line, which isn't going to show up on camera, but it is there. I've scribed a line here where I think it's going to have to be butt welded in on this edge. But what I'll do is I'll cut slightly below that and then I'll sneak up on that. And what I'm going to do is I'm not cutting this whole panel off right now. All I want to do is I want to cut this edge off like so and that will allow the panel to actually lay on here and be in the correct position. So now that I have my edge ready for a butt weld I'm going to lock in my door gap by placing a tack weld on the top and the bottom edge of the cab corner. And the rest of it right now is just overlapping uh, the, uh, the old cab corner or what's left of it. Now I'm gonna take my zip wheel and I'm gonna cut through the bottom layer of the old cab corner. This is gonna allow the new cab corner to relax into place. And I'm just gonna work it a little at a time and push it into place. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to align it all for a uh, butt weld. So I push it into place, make sure both uh, panels on the joint are flush, and then I place a tack weld uh, about every inch or so, and that's just gonna hold it into place. Uh, it helps to do this a little at a time and not just cut the whole thing at once. For a tighter gap, you can also use a reciprocating saw and uh, works a little nicer, a little more accurate, but uh, the zip wheel of death uh, makes a lot of sparks and it's a lot more spectacular for YouTube. And uh, this is just meatball surgery. We're not going for perfection here. So uh, it works just fine. I was originally taught this about 11 years ago when I first got started out in the trade. Don't use it a whole lot anymore when I'm TIG welding because it's not accurate enough. But when you're just trying to hammer stuff together with the uh, MIG, it sure uh, does a pretty uh, acceptable job. Well, I got this thing spliced and uh, tack welded in. And then once I get a tack welded in, I like to grind off all the tacks. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which we've discussed in older videos, but in case you're new here, 
I, first reason I grind them is just so that when I go to fully weld this, I now have a consistent playing field and I'm not trying to weld into a bunch of big nuggets that are sticking out because if you do that then you're more likely to get pinholes because then you're not getting full penetration any time you get near one of those blobs of weld so I just knock it down and then it's now smooth and I can just go across and lay a nice consistent weld across there uh, second reason I do that is I'm using it as a gauge and what I'm trying to do is make sure that I've got both planes of the metal reasonably flush with each other whereas one side of the metal isn't going to be higher than the other side they're both like that if you have one side higher than the other not really a big deal but you do have to be careful when you go to grind it because if you try and grind it so it's totally smooth then you're going to be thinning out whatever side of the metal is higher and like what's the point of doing all this rust repair and replacing all this thin metal if you're just going to come back in with a grinder and then grind it all thin again to show you what i'm talking about here we have the first tack weld that we did right in the door jam here and you can see i ground it off and it's flush here on this bottom layer but on the top it's still proud whereas we look at this weld here and this is completely flush all the way through so when we go back to weld this and grind this this is all going to be nice and flush but this is going to leave a ledge and again that's not a big deal but when you're grinding you want to stop when you see this you don't want to keep going stop as soon as you grind off the weld and you start seeing the grinder touch the surrounding metal because if you keep going you're going to thin this part and first of all this is an edge so that's extra bad you don't want thin metal on an edge because that's the the strongest point and that's where it's going to want to crack on you first anyways obviously this is getting mig welded which means it's all getting body worked anyways just for the sake of argument i'm going to slice slice through this uh tap it down and just get it a little more flush there um just so that it finishes out a little nicer and this is youtube so we have to put more effort in than we normally would there now you can see that is much closer to being nice and flush uh, if nothing else uh, you want to try to get your edges as close as possible typically not good practice to sculpt your edges out of filler uh, but I mean the rest of it doesn't really matter but if anything is going to get chipped it's going to be your edge so try to at least get that dialed in anyways we close our door and you can see we've got uh, an acceptable gap all through here at least uh, for a 70 year old uh, farm truck I'm not trying to make it perfect but uh, this is certainly I would say acceptable for what we're trying to do so now that we got this dialed in I am ready to final weld and I do have it clamped at the bottom right now but I don't want to do the plug welds or spot welds first I want to weld this seam first because if I weld this seam and something goes horribly wrong as I mentioned in the last video a lot easier to cut this apart than trying to cut through a plug weld if you plug weld it all on and then you have to cut it apart uh, you're probably going to need to buy a new cab corner because it'll just be absolutely mangled whereas this I can just zip through this and then re-weld it but uh, technically gaps are good everything seems to be okay here at least for an aftermarket patch panel so I'm fairly confident that I won't have to cut this apart again
And there's the final product. It's far from good and good from afar, but uh, arguably better than a rusted out cab corner. Camera always makes things look better than they are, but uh, we weren't trying to metal finish this out. We were just uh, trying to get it on there. So it'll need a bit of a intervention with our friend Phil. But uh, see the door gap here is uh, quite good for one of these trucks. So I'm quite pleased with that. That was uh, kind of the main concern. The rest I don't really care about. I did get the bottom plug welded on. Uh, just a quick note there. When I'm kind of fitting these things on the fly, like uh, you saw in the video there, I don't drill the holes for the plug welds until I've got the cab corner welded on. And the only reason for that is uh, if I just put them into this edge here, where I think they're going to be, by the time I get it all welded on and fit where it needs to be, those holes are going to be probably in the wrong spot because this edge isn't the same as what the original was. If you look at the front here, uh, you can see where I put a couple uh, stitch welds just on that edge. Now this edge here is actually supposed to be in alignment with this edge. So you can see how far out this bottom is and that's not just the bottom. I had to roll this whole thing that far ahead to actually get the cab corner to line up with the door. So we look inside the jam here, I actually had to add a three quarter inch strip of metal to the bottom here. That's how far I had to roll this entire cab corner up at the front here to actually get it to line up and to get everything to fit in the most relaxed state. Again, that's why I definitely recommend sectioning them in here because you can get the cab corner to fit a lot better. It just this this edge just isn't uh, made very well on the patch but at the same time the factory cab corner was rubbing at the bottom of the door and didn't fit either so i don't know maybe it's just a canadian truck thing maybe these cab corners fit awesome on the u.s built trucks i don't know or or what pretty hard to say you know it's this is pretty typical on these aftermarket panels and Every one of these uh, 47 to 53 or whatever trucks that I've worked on has had the same cab corner fitment issue. So this uh, had to do the same thing on every one. Uh, sometimes I'll just cut it off and remake this entire edge here. But I figured for the purpose of this video I'd do it this way because most of you probably don't have a shrinker stretcher or a brake or any tools. You just buy the cab corner and you want to weld it on. So this is how you make it work. Uh, the other thing is on these older GM trucks, there's not enough meat on the bottom here to get a plug weld or a spot weld in. So what the factory did is they just put a couple of blobs of braze in here just to hold it. These days there's not really any practical reason for brazing on a car or truck or whatever, uh, especially if you have a MIG welder. Uh, unless you're Randall R from uh, Shed by the Tracks and you're building a period correct Model T Speedster and then brazing is a, is a still very much a viable option. But in this case, I just uh, re replaced the, the brazing with uh, my MIG weld. I just did a couple beads with the MIG welder. So this is all, this edge, whole bottom edge is all secured now. Arguably better than uh, it was from factory because the factory quite often just breaks away as it did on this one. You actually see as we go higher up, there's another blob of braze. Well, here's the last spot weld and everything from here down was just a couple blobs of braze holding it on. So it wasn't very securely attached from factory. I did put a couple extra welds in here and then, you know, fairly long stitches along the bottom here. So this is way more secure than, it, than it's ever been in the past 70 years. So it should be uh, should be fairly solid there. I can't remember if I showed the before on the jam on the other side. So I'll just show you uh, how it was done on the driver's side just to show you just how crude these were originally. So we got uh, one blob of braze that uh, isn't even holding anything anymore. We got another one there. And then we got, they actually cut a slit in the cab corner there to try and get it to lay in. And at the bottom here, they just beat the snot out of it. 
And you see that's all angled in and mangled and uh, this is all factory. That's just the way they were done. And it looks like maybe there's some kind of very weak braze joint there. So really uh, wasn't ever a whole lot holding these things on to begin with. Just wanted to also show you this uh, cab corner. I cut off another one of these trucks that I did a while back because I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so this was repaired way back in the day when the truck probably would have only been 10, 15 years old. But if we look here on the inside, you can see where they just overlapped it. And uh, if you look really close, you can see where they pie cut this. I think this probably was like a panel off another car and then they, they just cut a curved panel off and then pie cut it on the bottom to make it fit into a cab corner. You can see where they, they brazed it there. And then all along here, it was brazed on the edge. And then up here, it was brazed over top the old one. And then they, they all this up here is all lead. So they leaded it all in. And uh, obviously not acceptable by today's standards, but it's just really uh, interesting to see how things were repaired back then. It still would have been a pretty uh, time consuming repair, especially on a 15 year old farm truck. It's pretty interesting just how much work uh, people would put it back into these to keep them on the road back then. I'm probably the uh, literally the only person out there who uh, thinks this kind of stuff is cool. But uh, leave a like, I guess, if you uh, geek out over old, poorly done bodywork and uh, rust repairs. As I promised in the last video, and I'm sure you have all been uh, waiting uh, for with eager anticipation, I'm going to get these plug welds done on this cowl panel and once we get that done then that more or less wraps up all the metal work on the passenger side of this truck. Thus concludes the metalwork on this side of the cab. And just in the nick of time too, because I was almost gonna have to clean and sweep up my floor to make some room to work, but now I can just relocate all my tools to the other side and ignore this massive mess. Fortunately, there's still an obscene amount of work to do on the driver's side. You gotta do basically all the exact same repairs we just did on the passenger side, except we got a little extra detail here we got to put the cowl vent in on this side to convert this to an earlier cab and then we got a big dent on the cab corner back here so we're gonna knock that out so I should be able to blast through this side a lot faster because I'll probably just time-lapse all the stuff that we did before because there's no point in repeating it twice and then we'll do a video on doing the back date on the cowl we'll do a video on that dent on the back and then maybe just kind of a time lapse with highlights of actually replacing all these panels even though we just uh, did it on the other side uh, we still probably want to just have a quick fast forward of that just so people can see it come together I guess and if we run into any issues on this side then we can talk about them then but not having to explain every single thing I do uh, sure makes things go a lot faster. I spend more time on that and making videos than I do doing actual work on this So I hope you uh, are all enjoying uh, this series so far way behind on this project and every day The GMC outside gets uh, more snowed in and more frozen to the ground and it gets colder and colder out So I got to get this cab done so I can move that truck in strip it down put this cab on and then we have to do the corner window graph we're converting this to a five window if you're new here and uh, so that's going to be a whole video in itself uh, and going to be quite a challenge well thanks for uh, watching and thank you to all the patrons and the people doing the super chats and the super thanks as well as all you uh, people who are watching and liking and uh, following on the videos and all that stuff and also uh, I don't thank you enough but uh, those of you who are sitting through the ads and watching those, uh, that makes uh, that helps a lot too. I really, really notice it in the the whatever the thing 
it uh, helps uh, kind of well make me feel like I'm not completely wasting my time doing all these videos for what is essentially free it's kind of cool to see a little bit of uh, money coming in uh, we had a good month in uh, November here even though I didn't have a video for the first two weeks so I'm hoping December will uh, be good as well I'm told that November and December are kind of the best uh, two months for for ad revenue and stuff so I might try to put out an extra video but uh, yeah just uh, thanks to all of you and uh, like I said thanks to those of you who are watching the ads as well uh, if you're not watching them I certainly understand and I'm not going to force anyone to I I despise them well so far none of you have even complained about the ads in the videos so that's really cool um, like I said it, it they're that offensive to you just just skip them or whatever but um, if YouTube had their way there would be an ad every two minutes in the video and I try to space them out I delete like sometimes over half of the ads that they want to put in and then I try to space them out so they're like eight to ten minutes apart which is basically what you would get on TV these days I would assume I haven't had TV in uh, like six or seven years now so if I put more ads in, there would be an increase in revenue, but like uh, I just I just can't like it's it's it would make the videos unwatchable. I think even now as it is, I have to go in and manually delete all the ads I don't want, and then I have to try and place the ones I do want in the video at a good interval where it's not interrupting me talking, which still happens because their their whole ad thing is kind of glitchy and that's, it is what it is anyways i got uh way sidetracked i'm gonna have to edit out uh, a whole bunch of stuff i just started rambling on about nothing again so uh thanks again to all of you and i uh, hope to see you back again we're going to be doing more uh most likely rust repair and metal work on this cab here big surprise there we got lots of to do on the driver's side as you saw so i hope you all will uh return again and uh, don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe, it uh, really means a lot to me. And what did you think of the show today, Poe?